Hello, good evening. <laughs> In honor of Black History Month, we're here with Code First Girls talking about black women in tech and how to flourish. My name is Amy Godin. I'm co-founder of Become. And my journey into tech, I'd say, was a little different to most. Um, I started out um, heading up the marketing for the Hoxton Hotel Group before going on to freelance marketing and finally in-house with Smart Tech who um, sell and showcase the world's latest innovations. So I was their global head of marketing there before starting up with uh, Become Zara. Hi, I'm Zara Kazim, and I'm also co-founder of Become. Um, I don't actually work in tech. I'm uh, on my way to being a trainee solicitor at a commercial law firm. Um, and yes, Amy and I co-founded Become earlier on this year. And I'm just going to go a bit into um, who become are. Essentially, we support young women of color ages 18 to 25 with becoming whoever they want to be. And we do this through passing on actualized skills. So we're getting away from the, the traditional careers events of, you know, this is how you get into consulting or this is how you become a doctor and focus transferable skills from a range of great women across industry, much like the women we have speaking here today. Um, aside from this, we also provide consultancy services to corporations um, so that they can create safer environments for young women of colour and also retain the people that they hire um, from our pool of attendees. We're really excited to get going today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the comments section below um, throughout, and we'll make sure to go through them at the end. So we'll have a 15 minute Q&A at the end of the session. Um, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first speaker, Augustina. Hi everybody, my name is Augustina and I am a graduate software technology manager at ARM and a recent work university engineering graduate we're excited to have you here welcome thank you <laughs> i'd love to bring in next ifa hi my name is ifa i'm currently a graduate software engineer at vodafone i graduated from warwick last year in 2019 and then i spent five months doing technology pr before realizing it was not for me at all <laughs> and so i decided to move to the other side of tech doing software engineering Lovely, honestly, there. that's fantastic. <laughs> um, glad to have you here tonight. Um, and on to our next speaker, we have Montana. Hi, my name is Montana. I'm, I'm a customer success manager uh, for a software company called We Got Pop, uh, who specialize in tech that supports uh, TV and film production. Um, and before that, I had worked for Apple for about six years as a technician. Welcome, Montana. And finally, last but not least, um, I'd love to welcome Chloe. Hi everybody, my name is Chloe and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Chloe Digital, which provides tech support and digital strategy to lifestyle influencers. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Um, you're all a great panel with us today. So my first question will be for Ife. Um, your role has led you into the world of tech, as you said, you started off in tech PR. Um, so what actually made you exactly change focus? Okay, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit to when I was about 13 and I honestly just wanted to be rich. So I was like, had my eyes set <laughs> on being a banker and I was just like, that's what I was going to do. And then in uni, my first year of university, I think it was about week one, and I realized everyone was more interested in what spring week I had applied to instead of my name. And so that just put me off completely. Like I don't really want to work in <laughs> an industry where that is sort of this obsession. Like, you know, what bank are you applying to? Like what, what spring week? have you done like this is first week of freshers like they're a little bit more chilled at this point so it just it put me off completely and because I was like so gone home on it from the age of 13 I was a bit like um disillusioned and I had always been really creative so I was um all, I have like a YouTube in my spare time and I have a podcast so I thought naturally like I really do enjoy um creativity but I also was doing maths and economics so I wanted something that was like a blend of the two and 
PR was sold to me as something that was a blend of the two. And so I was looking in PR and advertising. Mm. And so I was on a grad scheme, a PR grad scheme, working with tech companies specifically. And it was sort of luck that I was put with tech companies. And I just found that I was really, really into tech. And the people around me weren't really like into tech, it seemed, which surprised me because it was technology PR and it was all about like solving the story and like selling the story of tech. And I found myself just a lot more like intrigued than people I was working around. And so I just realized it wasn't for me. And I, cause I came from an analytical background, I sort of had those skills and I, I find it easy to sort of learn things that are like problem solving and things that are like, you know, mathematical, analyst, analytical, logical, et cetera, et cetera. And I think tech is so, so creative and being like being in that, I can see how much more creative it is than the so-called creative role that I was doing at a PR agency. And so it was, it was all of those things basically that just led to me doing software engineering now. So yeah, it went from banking to PR to tech, and I hope to stay here for <laughs> as long as possible. Lovely. And Montana, what led you to We Got Pop? You're our only panelist that's not <laughs> kind of directly working in terms of you know, coding or working with tech directly. Um, what led you to your role? Um, so I kind of fell into tech, I guess, because I kind of fell into working for Apple uh, at 19 because I needed a job. <laughs> so that was kind of how that journey started. Um, and then I kind of, I think I realized after I left Apple that there was such like a much bigger world around tech and that kind of the kind of corporate Apple or retail Apple wasn't just the only thing that was kind of available, I guess. So I started to look into kind of other opportunities and I didn't necessarily like have the skill set, really respect what you guys can all do um, when it comes to things like coding and stuff like that. But I knew I had uh, an interest in tech and that I kind of wanted to stay kind of connected to tech. So I kind of started looking down the route of uh, customer success um and started really kind of leaning into that um and then i was obviously with zara for a brief period of time for esi media uh, which is where we met um but then moved on to we got pop which was kind of a combination of uh, my film production degree um and kind of my time at apple and kind of experiencing different types of tech and so forth fantastic augustina what led you to your role um, i'm one of those people that are like oh i liked technology from a very young age but actually the technology that I really loved was with cars. So I actually wanted to be a crash test engineer when I started university. But then I changed my mind and went to electronic engineering stream as opposed to mechanical engineering. And I learned a lot more about hardware. I learned a lot more about sensors. And I was like, this is where I want to be. And then I wanted to be a robotics engineer. But then I realized that talking to people and understanding what type of things they like, as well as understanding how people interact with technology was something that I was very interested in. And that's how I found myself working at and working within software technology management, which allows me to actually talk to clients and talk to other people about what type of things they need in their technologies, as well as working with project managers and engineers as well. So it's kind of like having the technical knowledge plus the business acumen together it just felt like a match made in heaven so that's how i got where i am today great i feel like we've got such an interesting range because yeah. like if has gone from the creative side being like i don't like that let's go <laughs> into tech um montana is well yeah i think customer success is super creative so you've kind of gone into a more creative side and as you said you studied film as well um, you know, whilst working at Apple. So there's a mix of both there. Um, let's head over to Chloe. Um, as a founder, I guess you're now, you know, an entrepreneur in the business world. Um, but I know your previous experience was in tech. Um, how was that? How did that transition come about? Sure. Firstly, oh my gosh, listening to you ladies' stories is absolutely <laughs> everything. Like, so inspiring. I love to hear that you graduated in software engineering. This is amazing. Um, so me, I got my start in tech. Well, let's just say when I was a teenager, um, about 15 years old, when I discovered MySpace and realized that you could code to make your profile look cute. 
Um, I <laughs> thought it was so magical. And at that moment, I knew that technology was creative and coding was creative because I could write and I could create something pretty. Like this was how my <laughs> mind would think at 15 and how my mind still thinks now at 31. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I, I had no idea that I would build a business or have a career in technology because at that time, 16 years ago, you know, nobody would speak about a career in tech. That wasn't a thing. And my parents loved them, uh, pushed me to pursue any of my dreams, um, but they never knew what I could be, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. I went to university and I went to university to study TV production um, and radio. And I found out at university that there was a sister course, which they were calling New Media, which was a, a web design course. Um, so that was the first time I realized that people actually coded for a job, I, I went to my head of the and I was like, so are you telling me people do this like for work? Because it was so fun. And you know, you grow up thinking that when you when you start to work, you don't do something that's fun, like you do it to make money and then like you go on holiday. So <laughs> I believe that I could do this as a job, which I just enjoyed in my spare time and I had an actual passion. Um, so I was just kind of coding on the side for a, a very long time. Anybody who wanted me to code their website, I would do it. Like the websites were absolutely awful at the time, but I was coding takeaway websites, my friends opening salons, like every, everything under the sun. Um, but as I grew up and I got into my early 20s, um, it was when the blogger scene started to come about in the UK and also in the US. And I had a lot of friends who were bloggers. So I'd go to a lot of a blogger type events and everyone would always ask me, you know, uh, what my uh, blog was. And I'd say, oh, I'm not a blogger. I'm actually a web developer. Um, and they'd always like break down because their site had had broken because, you know, their hosting had expired or they put these images that were too big on the site and it crashed. And I was always able to explain to them their technical problems in a way that they could understand. And that really became the base of why I started my business. So at the beginning of my business, I was doing all of the um, the the tech side myself, so all the bug fixes, the tweaks, site redesigns, etc. But now I have a full team who who do that, and I oversee them. Wow, wow. <laughs> that's, that's incredible! incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things when you first start out, it, you know, as an entrepreneur, you really do have to do it all. So to have your background is just incredible because that's the sort of thing you can't just kind of try and pick up on your own necessarily. That's something you've really got to learn and know your craft. Um, yeah. At Become, we really champion like mentoring. We really see the value in that. Um, I've always had a mentors. I know Zara's always had mentors. Um, and as, uh, on top of that, I think courses like what Code First Girls offer are just incredible. It can really take you, you know, to that next level in terms of your upskilling, but also help you actually get into a career that you want to be in. Um, so what are the main things that have helped you guys in your career so far? So any courses or mentors or anything that you think has been imperative to your success? Um, Augustina, let's start with you. Um, I think there have been definitely a couple of things. Social media has been something that I've been able to leverage um, in order to understand my role and technology is a lot better. I think that we're in a generation where people are a lot more open about their roles and there are a lot of entrepreneurs and there are a lot of freelancers that would be more than happy to give you advice. So that's something that I've been, especially in the past couple of months, really leveraging and really trying to use. Um, on top of that, I would say something that's been in my current role now that I've really appreciated to help with my job has actually been the team that I work with. So I think it's really important, no matter what industry you're in, to work with a really good team. And I feel like I'm very blessed to have an amazing manager and amazing um, people around me who are constantly looking out for my success, recommending me courses and things like that. Um, specific courses, I think when I realized that I wanted to work more on the hardware side, I remember using Code Academy and Treehouse and utilizing YouTube quite a lot. Um, YouTube has a lot of free resources that you can use to upskill in anything from cybersecurity to web development. So there's just, there's been a variety of different things that really. Wow, that's brilliant. I love what you said about having that support network around you as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's really important, isn't it? Um, I think particularly in the black community, I would say, um, mm -hmm. of people of color is something that we've definitely noticed. Um, yeah, having that support is really, really important. Um, yeah. Ifa, what about you? Yeah, I think similar. I think mentoring is really important. So I have like 
a couple of mentors. None of them are actually in tech. So um, one's an interior designer who's also an author. One's head of like a, a film production company, and the other is um, working at Google. Well, and so in tech, but not they're not working in a technical role. And I think it's just so amazing to have conversations with people who firstly love what they do because I don't think that you know I think loving what you do teaches you how to like look at the world of work in like a different way and I think a lot of people are used to this idea of working yeah. and being something that you have to do which it is like it is something you have to do but it you can love working as well you don't have to you know choose between the two and I think that is really what did push me out of um, you know something that I really didn't enjoy like I didn't see a lot of people who left their grad job after five months and I did feel like a bit like reckless and a bit like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. But I think that just looking up and looking around at people who love what they do, it just made me think, why, why, why do I like, why can't I love what I do? And so I think that's definitely that. And just, you know, speaking to people who have gone above you and then everything Augustina has said, like the YouTube courses, Udemy courses, like I don't think there's anything out there that can't help you fill the gap that you need for any job. So I don't think any job is beyond anyone. I think if you see a job that you want and you see the skills that you need, there is so much out there to build on those skills and, you know, apply for those jobs. So, yeah, that would be it. I love that. Follow your gut. <laughs> Go with your passion. Um, and Montana, what about you? What are the main things that have helped you in your career so far? Um, like, I think honing in on like a specific area that you feel like you have potential in and like something that you have like the potential to grow into mm -hmm. and then doing the research into that area to understand it. Like, so when I decided that I was going to go kind of go down the route of like customer success, like I kind of involved myself with as much content as possible around that area um and there are like like you just said there are so many people out there who like aren't as qualified as you may think or maybe <laughs> look like from their LinkedIn profiles yeah. and stuff like yeah. that so like if you're able to teach yourself to like walk the walk and talk the talk and pull on the experiences that you've got like I think that can lead to like something quite special um and play on your strength at all points like find out the ways that make you specifically like marketable Definitely. Um, I think it's really important to appear confident even when you're not. Um, and imposter syndrome is a real thing <laughs> that we really need to kind of have a think about and talk about because um, it's something that affects a lot of people, a lot of women in particular, I know. So, um, yeah, that confidence is key, isn't it? Um, and Chloe, over to you. What are the main things that have helped you, do you think, in your career? Yeah, to your point about like having to fake it, like one of my key lines is fake it till you make it and also <laughs> feel the fear and do it anyways. Like I think sometimes we think that when you see somebody achieving that they've been able to overcome fear and now they, that now they are no longer fearful, but they are fearful. They just push through when they feel it. And that's the, mm -hmm. that's the whole difference. Um, I'd say one of my key things I think is for mentors and coaches, they're very important. And I kind of want to put across that you don't need to be at a certain level to seek out a mentor or a coach. Mm -hmm. It is something that you should have mm -hmm. at every stage of your career, wherever you are building, going up the career ladder or you're starting a business. Because with us, unfortunately, we have this kind of um, ancestral limited beliefs um, around what we can achieve in this life. So it's very important to work with somebody mm -hmm the time who's outside of what you're doing to be that accountability partner for you to reach your goals and that's something that I really believe in I have those people whether they be in tech or whether not uh, people who are further on than me who are wiser who have made more money etc um, I find that very important and it took me a long time to seek those people out because I thought oh well I haven't made it yet or I need to be at a certain point in my career before I seek out these people but you might have just graduated from university you should still be seeking out that mentor from then yeah. and it might be a different person you're working with five years down mm -hmm. the line but have that type of mindset that you always need that kind of um ecosystem to help you get to your next mm -hmm. uh next, your next level oh, and yeah. um sorry what amy said about um faking it till you make it i um <laughs> i have a funny mm -hmm. story because i studied maths and economics and in my last year i did about two behavioral economics modules and i think i might have mentioned it in my interview like, as a passing thought and like my first week every call someone would be like oh you're the behavioral economics expert that we've had coming in <laughs> it was like 
what sorry I was just like oh you know it's, it's okay like the worst someone's gonna do is ask me for a definition or something and then they invited me to this workshop and they said just come with a few ideas and it's one minute in and they said okay if they're how are we doing this this was literally my third day and I was like sorry <laughs> but I, I just spoke about what I knew and obviously no one knew about it that's why they thought I was an ex expert so I could have told them anything and they would have taken it as gospel and I just think it's funny how um, you know, you might think behavioral economics has nothing to do with tech or psychology has nothing to do with tech, but because people may be coming from a certain technical background, that's something unique that you have that you can like use to yes. your advantage and become an expert, even though, you know, if I went to behavioral economics lecture with some of the things I was saying, I would get thrown out, but <laughs> they didn't know that. So. Yeah, I think that is so true. I think we've all been there when we've had to kind of just you know, work with what we've got basically mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. <laughs> make it work for us. I mean, I'm sure you all realize that you guys are kind of unicorns. I mean, <laughs> black mm -hmm. women in tech, um, there aren't as many as we'd probably like to see. And of course we want to encourage way more black women to go into tech and tech related roles. Um, mm -hmm. And I think kind of going along with what Augustina said about kind of the environment that you're in and the team you have around you and how that can really impact you. I was just wondering, in terms of your experience as black women in the tech space, have there been any things that you found kind of challenging? And if so, how have you overcome them? Anyone want to go first? I can go first if you want. Yeah, um, yeah. So I would say probably not actually in my grad scheme, but I remember in a couple of internships I did before, I was always the black person, you know, like not just a black woman, the black person. And I think that that has a lot of, there's a lot of pressure because it's kind of like everyone's watching you. So if you're not good, then there's that stigma, you know what I mean? But one of the biggest challenges for me was kind of working out how much of myself do I, feel comfortable being in a place. And I think that is something that a lot of people don't really appreciate when you're not a minority and especially when you're not black, that mm -hmm. there are times, especially when you're working in the Western world, that you feel like, I can't fully be myself because what if they think I'm weird? Or, you know, mm -hmm. like, what if I say something that they don't understand? But one thing I will definitely say, and it's quite, it's easier said than done, but understand your power and walk in your power. Like there is so much power because of your experiences, because of the things that you know that other people won't know, just as the virtue of being black, and just as the virtue of being a woman. And I think that when I came into my graduate scheme, I remember telling myself, I'm not gonna like dim myself for anyone. You're gonna see me and you're gonna like it. And that's that because I'm here because you know that I'm capable. I shouldn't have to feel uncomfortable in the environment. Saying that, however, one of the other challenges that I had um, previously was trying to explain to people why I didn't like that there wasn't a diverse team. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's also very hard because it's like a lot of the time, a lot of technology companies, and you see this when they're advertising diversity, they're like, oh, having uh, more diverse people increases the profit of the company by like 20% or whatever. And it's like, don't reduce me to a financial figure. So it's kind of trying to explain, it's annoying when you have to explain your value just by virtue of your own existence. That is something that really, really grinds my gears. But again, I literally, I've learned to just come into work and just be myself. And not everyone's gonna like that, just like in the real world, but you have to remember that you are made for it and there are also a lot of people that are like oh like women shouldn't be in technology and whatever but i always remember that way back in the day it was women that were working on computers it was women that were um using laptops when they first came out mm. but then when it started to be monetized and people try to push women out of the way you're meant to be in tech like it's mm. literally written as a woman that you're meant to be in technology because this is like we started here first so there's a lot of micro challenges, but I think that overarching, feel confident in who you are. Sometimes you do have to fake that confidence and that's okay as well. But also remember that you are there because you're good at what you do and never allow anybody to tell you different. Whether you started on day one or you've been there for 10 years, 
you're good at what you do and you're only going to get better. So. Uh, love that. That is so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, was preaching. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every said, we love it. Absolutely true. Because I think a lot of us can probably relate to the fact of having to explain outside of you know the monetary value why mm. a diverse team is really needed i think in some terms of just the social morality of it all um mm. in terms of fairness of opportunity i think people aren't bringing as much attention to that especially now it's more like well this can make you money so be yeah. diverse um mm -hmm. but what about just being a socially conscious company and just giving yeah. people a chance um, I'm just going to pop to you, Chloe. What are your thoughts? Um, obviously, you've got a team yourself. How do you make it a more diverse environment? The thing is, often when you have a black founder, diversity is not really something that you often discuss because it's just inherent. Because, yeah. you know, <laughs> like it's not like I'm like, oh, what's our diversity and inclusion plans? It's like, this, look at us. This is, this is <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, getting into the space, Yes, I did realize at the time that I was the only often female and black person mm -hmm. in the room. So you got those two double like bam, bam, bam uh, wham, whammies there. And I remember my, my dad used to tell me, you know, like, just don't worry about it. You know, you stand out, you're different. So people re will remember you over others and therefore mm -hmm. just do the job really, really well. Um, and people will remember re will remember you. And I always remember that to this day. Like I, I never saw me being as a minority, as a disadvantage to anything uh, that I was looking to achieve. But, mm -hmm. you know, being a diverse company and just having that just inherit you know, like not this trigger word that everyone wants to use now, like everyone wants you to be on their diversity committee. Like we're all, so like after the BLM popped up, it's like, oh yeah, we're all about being diverse. It's like, it's just mm, absolutely yeah. my um, And you're diverse mm -hmm. for a season, but let's see what you're like in 2021. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's about that social point about putting people forward who are the best at what they do and having those different voices around anything that you have to discuss. And of course, you're always looking for experts if you come to in their field um, but there are experts that come from multiple different um, backgrounds and then what you also have is kind of like outside of the the work talk because my team is fully remote so we communicate on slack all the time and my team are all around the world in about 15 different countries so because we all love what we're doing and we all love our mission to empower the women that we're helping with technology, it doesn't really matter where we're from. Like we all come together because we love that mission. Um, and I love the fact that I can work with somebody who is in Brazil or the Philippines or America or whatever and feel so connected to them, even though we have completely different backgrounds because we're all around that, that same goal. Yeah, like that's that. key. I think mm. it was really interesting what you said as well about how just by being a black founder, diversity has already kind of become inherent to your culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing that Become wants to focus on is not just recruiting um, a diverse team or more ethnic minorities or more women of color, but it's also about creating a safe environment for them creating an environment in which they can flourish. Uh, hence the title of today's talk. Um, it's about allowing them to have the tools that they need um, to reach leadership roles, because yeah. that, there always seems to be a gap there. You get loads of people in, but when it comes to the leadership of a company, diversity numbers go down by far. Um, what about you, Montana? What are your thoughts about your experience as a black woman in the workplace? I mean, echoing what everyone's already said, really, I think, but I think it's it's so crazy because I'm often the only like black woman in the space and I'm mixed. So like that is insane <laughs> because it's like, wow. Um, yeah, everything you guys have said, I think is echoing um, very much so. And I think you're right. It's that thing where we don't seem to have any people of color in general, but any black people at like a managerial or a C-suite level when it comes to businesses. And that's definitely, I think has an effect on kind of the overall environment and it can be really hard to kind of feel like you to shine I guess in these environments because you want to assert yourself in a space that's like really fast paced and like all of that all the stuff that comes with tech environments but like out of fear you kind of back away from doing that um mm -hmm. and I think that's something I do and I think there's something that you guys all have in common that I don't have as much as the support network 
And I think that really makes a huge difference in like your experience as like a solo black woman or a solo woman of color is to have that network. Because even though everyone that you're in that group of is still going through the same thing, um, there's an understanding uh, that you can all have together, which I think can really help and help push you and help develop you. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. So how do you think people could better get that network you were talking about? networking <laughs> no, <laughs> even like stuff like this is like reaching out to uh individuals like you said social media and things like linkedin and stuff like that mm -hmm. attending events and connecting with people afterwards mm -hmm. to try and build those things up i think it's all about like i guess it depends on your circumstances as well and where you come from like if you have like a good family background for example and you might have kind of that influence and support from like your family or your like culture for example um or depends on kind of where you kind of got brought up if you got brought up in a more predominantly white area like i did and um, then you kind of find yourself just kind of jumping from sort of education to job after job and the environment doesn't really seem to change mm -hmm. and then you kind of get to where I am which is at sort of 28 years of life and obviously I've you know I'm comfortable with my my blackness and who I am as a, as a human being but I feel quite isolated I guess professionally and personally from from black women um and that's because of the environments I've been in over the years so yeah I think that would be my advice for such cautionary tale <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's a really interesting one with this this year in particular just I mean I always kind of say as a disclaimer when I'm on these panels, it's like I can speak as a mixed race person, but I cannot speak as a black person, uh, a black woman, because that's that's what this year has taught me more than anything is that, um, you know, I have to check my privilege as well in its own way. And that my my struggles and my experiences are are different from um, from black women and from white women. Um, and that that differentiation has never really been addressed, um, you know. Back in 1994, when I was born, uh, on my birth ticket, I'm listed as as black. You know, that's the box you had to tick because there wasn't even a mixed race box back then. And um, so you kind of like, yeah, for the first time, I think this year, it's been an interesting thing to to kind of work through that and realize that, yeah, I'm kind of neither and both. <laughs> and um, yeah, I know what you mean about kind of being, feeling that kind of isolation, but also being connected to both. It's an, yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? yeah but yeah you know, i think it's also when you come from a mixed race background it's it's you yes definitely the privilege there the privilege is there definitely mm -hmm. but there's i think if you have a drop of insert race blood and you kind of you kind of present that way socially as well mm -hmm. like you will always be kind of seen like that by mm -hmm. kind of white society but no 100 percent, i 100 percent agree yeah okay um, Ife, I'm also going to ask you, have you noticed a difference in terms of moving from tech PR to now being a grad software engineer? Did you like feel the diversity <laughs> reduced? <laughs> oh, that is a very, very interesting question. Yeah, so <laughs> I really love where I am now. It's um, a great company. It's very diverse. I think like, for example, the CEO of the Ghana arm is a black women and it's just so nice to be in an environment where that doesn't really seem to be a factor to be completely honest mm -hmm. PR and advertising I mean the mad men like it's you know what I mean it was it was <laughs> white men in suits that's literally like the history of what PR is and the fact that I've heard phrases like you know we're trying to roughen up the PR image and make PR cool and I've had creative directors ask me what the cool in term is that is definitely something you know that did <laughs> push wow. me out as well yeah. as the job just being dull and boring I try not to sleep <laughs> about PR too much because it just it just was not a great five months for me but I think there are definitely like great things happening in that industry and it is changing for the better but yeah I think tech is i don't know it's just something that i've always seen as a lot more inclusive and yeah there are the issues such as you know face detection and, and all of that but i think with things that are scientific subjects you can't argue with that like if i get a hundred percent in this maths exam you can't tell me that it's like my race made me worse like you can't i've got a hundred percent and so i actually sort of forget a lot of the times that i'm a black woman in tech, if that mm. makes sense, in terms of that being a hinder. And I went to a very like competitive girls school and like everyone was sort of crazy, like everyone wanted to be the best. And I say that in like a positive way because men in society are always competing, whether it's like, 
football or or you know banking or finance it's like and it's not seen as a bad thing but if a girl wants to you know compete with another girl we like it, it, it's made to like we belittle it and we make it you know look petty and it doesn't have to be like you can compete in a positive way and it wasn't until i was 18 that i went to like a maths camp and someone said to me a guy said to me a white guy said to me um oh just sit in the corner and make the poster look pretty I was I was genuinely shocked because coming from the the school I went to and where everything is basically on merit, I was I was confused to be honest. Like it, it hadn't it hadn't you know what I mean. And I think mm. when you're reminded in ways like that, it mm. can be disheartening. But mm. you just have to remember, I guess, like how far you've come and realize that yeah. being a black woman in tech is actually a superpower because you've mm. gone through, you've literally gone through like sexism, you've gone through racism, like you've literally knocked down those barriers and you're in the same position as people who didn't have to. And I think that you just have to keep on reminding yourself. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't even think yeah. I blinked when I heard, I was, I was shocked, but I wasn't hurt because I just think you're crazy. Like we're in the same place. <laughs> We're yeah. literally on the same camp. Like, what, <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do, to be honest. But um, yeah, I think being a black woman in tech is so amazing. And it's so amazing to be on, on a chat like this and everyone comes from such different backgrounds. And yeah, I mean, we're changing the, change, changing the face of tech. And I think that is really amazing. That's brilliant. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's kind of hope, I think, this year. Through, through it all, it's been... A year of change obviously with coronavirus the black lives matter movement it's just been one thing after another but i think there is kind of like hope on the horizon i think people are still trying to navigate how they talk about diversity inclusion and um make their their employees feel welcome and included in every conversation and that their voices are heard um so i'm hoping there's some positive change to come but i'd love to know this is a sort of two-part question um a um what does black history month mean to you and b how has this year kind of changed your experience of working as a black woman in tech? Um, is there anything particular that's kind of changed for you within that? Um, should we start with Chloe? Sure. So Black History Month is a weird one for me. I'm not going to lie. You know, we've obviously had it for a long time and grown up with it. I don't know how I feel about a, a specific month to celebrate our blackness, but at the same time, there are campaigns around different things at different times and it just helps you even as a, thinking as a, like a marketer you know to be able to speak about something during a certain time and amplify it even bigger mm -hmm. than if it was throughout the year then i kind of get it for that outside of that mm -hmm. i have mixed, uh, beliefs around it um mm -hmm. the the movement honestly i mean like i'm sure we all felt exactly the same at the beginning like obviously traumatized you know struggled for a, a while um, running a company, there was a two week sprint where I, I really struggled um, and actually my team actually came through and supported me um, when I found it very difficult to, you know, up, you're dealing with your own stuff in your mind, you're dealing with your history, you're dealing with what you're seeing on social media constant, then you're also dealing with like being re-educated and things that we weren't educated about at school and all of a sudden people finding videos about what happened in 18 something something and you, it was just very overwhelming mm -hmm. um and then you've got your white allies coming to you and asking how we can help and you're just like i don't know you know <laughs> yeah. like, i'm not the gatekeeper i don't know <laughs> and it just reminded me of when you were at when i was at university and like you know the, the white friend asked you like how do you wash your hair like it just reminded oh. me of that it was just too much um but at first at first that was overwhelmed but my character the entrepreneur in me is always thinking about okay well what can i do how can i support um how can i help in the way that i know how so i started to think about what i could do to almost uh, support and even do more things like this and to speak more about me being a black female in tech now mm. i always had this kind of um this feeling and also Sharmadine reed from a beauty stack mm. I, I watched her story and she said the same thing and i was like wow that's exactly what i thought i had this feeling that in my bigger plan so my bigger plan is to create a charity or create these things that help young girls young black girls get into technology right this was my goal at the end of my journey to then come back and then help them and i realized that i couldn't actually wait that long like that doesn't make any sense for me to wait so i hit a certain milestone in my business for me to set this up or 
or, or, or whatnot, because we don't know when anything is going to end. And also they need the support from you right now, Chloe. They don't need it five years from now. They need it today. And I really had that in my five year plan. I had no dream of, of no immediate dream of starting that. And that was one of the biggest things for me. Like, what can I do to support now with the means I have today? Doesn't mean that I'm not going to be creating an even bigger impact in five years from now, but I must start today. Um, and I think that was one of the biggest things that I learned, like taking my own uh, unique scenario of being this black woman in tech and how can I support other black women in tech who are my peers as well, which is also important. Um, and then also the girls coming up as well. Yeah. And that's not easy. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm at the, I guess I'll say the beginning of my career. I'm about to start my training contract next year. And, you know, being in law school and also doing become, as Amy will tell you, has been insane. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's worth it at the end of the day, because like you mm -hmm. said, um, the, the women we want to help, they need our help now. now. Um, mm -hmm. And also we're fresh, we have ideas. It's not reaching a certain milestone that's going to make those ideas any more valid or mm -hmm. make what we have to say or our lived experiences any more valid. So that's yeah. great, Chloe. Has, have you started that? Have you started that? Yeah. Now? Definitely. So we're, we're looking to kind of help girls in actual coding. So this is perfect that we're doing this. Um, and then me personally starting off, I'm doing as many panels and talks and sessions as I can to 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 speak to these girls, um, because I know sporadically when I have done talks and I have met young girls who have been interested in coding and I've heard things like, you know, you know, like, oh, um, I saw a, a vacancy to be an engineer at said company. And when I applied, you know, I didn't get through and then they gave up afterwards and then they went oh. and moved to something else. And it's like, well, why? You know, you only tried one time, like yeah. dying and, yeah. and it's because they, they weren't seeing any women like us day to day being like, hey, like we're doing it, we're, we're living it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the other things I'm trying to do is put myself more out on social media, even though I absolutely hate it, but put myself more out on social media because I know it does help. And I, I get the DMs from girls being like, oh, wow, I didn't know that you did this. And it helps them like what you were saying there it's like in that pivotal moment that they're dealing with right now like what course should i take at university right now what job should i go to right now um yeah yeah and as part of that i think we're just looking at a project at the moment which is working with um engineering companies specifically on um their job application and literally just the terminologies used can make it kind of quite ostracizing to women or um, people of color because the words they're using are very kind of like masculine maybe quite corporate um maybe things that aren't actually really appealing to yeah young women of color um so we're trying to yeah work on that and see how we can help improve that terminology and make it more accessible um montana what about you so what does black history month mean to you and um has this year changed for you um anything in terms of your experience uh, working as a, a woman in tech um same sort of answer as chloe which is just that um yeah it's i think off the back of everything that's happened this year and then coming to sort of black history month it was quite intense because you start mm -hmm. to see like all this performative stuff happening like mm -hmm. in the news across companies mm -hmm. and that can be like quite stressful quite triggering obviously depending on kind of what experiences you've had and stuff like that so um but like for me like this year i just i've tried to like tune off of that and take a step back and actually learn about like black british history because like i didn't know like in full mm -hmm. depth about it and i want to know about it in full depth so i've just been kind of taking my own time mm -hmm. out to kind of learn about my own my own culture basically and like west indy culture and kind of what happened um, rather than kind of the Americanized version that we're also used to hearing, which is obviously super important, but also, um, you know, not relevant specifically to myself or like my culture um, or my family members. Yeah. So I'm um, trying to do that. Um, in terms of um, a kind of, I guess, like changing my experience, like in tech, like I wouldn't say it's changed because everything that's happened this year is just like a, a reminder that there's so much work to be done across you know mm -hmm. societies companies governments um but like mm -hmm. i think and in some ways it's kind of made it a little bit harder because you kind of have like you said probably you have your own like little small world what's going on for you very specifically mm -hmm. and you zoom out and there's all this other madness happening and it can be hard and it can be really upsetting but um i think we have to just like remember to be kind and take care of ourselves and like we've said on this already like i think there's that pressure to push hard because of the whole kind of black excellence yeah. narrative 
um, mm. and the pressure that comes with that. And yes, whilst it is important to push ourselves and be the best that we can be, and kind of like you said, be the gate openers for the next generation, um, we have to make sure that we don't burn out before we get there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, absolutely agree with that. I think after this, we've probably got time for one more question, just conscious of time, then we'll get to some uh, comments. Um, if it, what about you? What do you think about Black History Month? Yeah, so um, I think it's something that recently I see celebrated more. I honestly don't have like any recollection of like a whole month like being celebrated, like Black History Month being celebrated when I was younger, mm -hmm. to be completely honest. Um, like one time I grew up in a predominantly like white area, predominantly white school, so that probably has <laughs> a huge mm -hmm. part to do with that. But um, I just love being black, to be completely honest. Um, the start of this, like the April time, was really, really difficult because I found, pe I saw people who a couple of years ago would tell me I was exaggerating or like if there's no such thing as a microaggression suddenly become mm. Martin Luther King and it was very very <laughs> confusing <Yeah>. to be <laughs> honest <laughs> like I was just being frank I and there was a period where I was just genuinely annoyed and I just couldn't open social media and of course I have to remember it it's bigger than me and at the end of the day the uprising that happened it, it was able to you know reach yeah. like news platforms like the BBC and the ITV who weren't talking about it before so I think in every negative there is a positive to take away from that but my yeah. focus now is black people and it's black people being happy and being comfortable being themselves and what Montana said about yeah. black excellence that is great like that is fantastic but so is black mediocrity like so is a black mm -hmm. person just being mm -hmm. themselves and like being normal yeah. I think that's the most powerful thing that you can do like when the world wants to put you in a box yes. and wants to shut you down the most yeah. powerful thing you can do is literally be yourself and like it's amazing mm -hmm. that we're in tech but there are so many other jobs out there and it doesn't make you any less of a person. It doesn't make you any less black or any more white. Like, oh, you're so white. No, like we're we're all black. Like whoever, like being black is being black. <laughs> so yes. um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all that's I have brilliant. to say. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And finally over to Augustina. Like, you black history about Sorry. Sorry, a little bit of <laughs> technical glitch there. Augustina, what about you? Um, yeah, I kind of echo the sentiments of Black History Month. I see Black History Month um, as something that I celebrate now more than I did before, but also I see it as an opportunity for allies to put in the work and to mm -hmm. actually learn about Black culture and learn about Black history and learn about um, how, like, what Blackness is. For me, I have always had an interest in like Africa and the Caribbean when it comes to technology innovation and things like that. But with everything that has happened this year, it's not only made me want to propel that knowledge, but also look at it closer to London and where I am currently in the UK as well. Um, one thing that has also done for me to kind of accelerate my knowledge and understanding, especially within technology is learning more about the interdisciplinary aspects of technology. So I came from an engineering background and when I was in college, I did a BTEC in engineering and A-level math. So I've always had that engineering aspect, but it's actually with everything that's gone on, I've been able to learn more about race and how that plays in with ethics and technology. And I've been able to learn more about anthropology, which I absolutely love. And so it's kind of in that way, it's pushed me to think like, what can I do, like echoing clear, what can I do now to make a change that will benefit the people around me? Saying that, however, I think that, again, about the whole like black excellence thing, sometimes I don't want to be excellent. Sometimes I just want to do my thing, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I just want to chill and relax. And there is that pressure where I say, oh, you're black and you're the only black person here and you have to be like fantastic. You don't say that to your white counterparts. So that like, I'm good. I'm going to say it. I'm going to do what I can do and I'm going to, push myself I'm never going to push myself to the point where it's too exhausting and it's too stressful and I think that I started my um, graduate job only like a month ago off the back of doing an internship there as well and I had to take it slowly I had to tell my team like guys it's a lot so forgive me if I'm not as present I need time for myself and I think that when you're in the corporate world and when you're working technology and other aspects, it's very important to look after your mental health and black mental health is something that's extremely important and something that we need to look out for as well, especially off the back of all of this. Yeah, absolutely agree. 
Um, I think we're going to have to um, go over to some questions from our audience. We've had so many questions coming in, so thank you all so much. Um, the first question we have here is from Hanisha Patel, and it's how do you get a mentor? So we don't know how to answer this, but whoever would like to jump in here, please do. Um, I would say how to get a mentor. Um, if you're working in a company, definitely just reach out. I remember as an intern, I sent like 50 emails to people in my company from like VP. I'm pretty sure I emailed the CEO as well. Like I just emailed everyone. And I was like, look, this is me. This is what I do. I just started here. Like, do you have a couple of minutes to talk? And from there, I was able to build really good relationships with amazing people that I still talk to now. Um, also, one thing that I learned very, like about last year, was that you should not neglect your peers as mentors as well. Um, people that may be on the same level as you, they will still have different experiences and they'll still have different things that they know that you can learn from and you can also offer support. So that's how I would do it. Just to piggyback off that, um, the yeah peers, I completely agree with that. I always have a, a friend who is in the industry be an accountability partner to myself. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes being the boss, like you're just like, oh, you know, I'll just get that done next week because no one's telling you you need to get it done today. So um, having an accountability partner with a friend, I think, is often really helpful. And then for the mentor space, like from from the other side of what I receive when people are asking me to mentor them or whatnot, you know, sometimes maybe the person might not have the availability to be a full on mentor, but they might have time for a 15 minute Zoom date, mm -hmm. coffee date, whereby you could send them like a Starbucks coffee voucher for them to get a coffee. And then you could sit there on 15 minutes or 20 minutes on Zoom and speak to them. Um, so that's something to kind of think about when you're kind of reaching out and emailing people to be a mentor. Don't just be like, I need a mentor. Help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get hundreds of emails I get hundreds of emails a day so the vibe needs to be very much like you know you've seen the person do something amazing you've appreciated them um maybe give them some kind of compliment and say if it is possible at x time next week for 15 minutes to have a chat with them please can, can I do so and often people will say yes like 15 minutes isn't a long it seems like not a long time but you can get a lot of juice from just 15 mm. minutes yeah yeah, a lot of my mentors have come from mentoring programs. So it's like, I, it's quite a long way, but I think it's um, it's worth it. So Google do one called Bold Immersion, which I would mm -hmm. definitely recommend if you're, I think, first to third year uni, but you might want to double check um, on that. And the rest have been um, creative agencies. But yeah, mentoring programs, if you can find one. Oh, great. And speaking of mentors, um, there will also be the opportunity to gain a mentor through Become. Um, so if you check out our website and sign up to our newsletter, we'll soon be releasing opportunities for mentoring in tech and outside of tech as well. Um, we've got a great question now from Marie Justina. Um, you mentioned one just now, Ife, but she asked, what other networks are you a part of or would recommend for Black women in tech? Stemets. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Any other ones, guys? Um, there's one on Twitter that was founded about a month ago or a month and a half called Black Girls in Tech. You should be able mm -hmm. to type it in. Um, we have like a WhatsApp group. There's almost like 200 women in there. It's absolutely fantastic. Really, really good. Great. There's also um, Coding Black Females, which I've heard of as well. Yes. Um, which is specific to black women. Um, what about you, Chloe? What's the name of your charity? Oh, I haven't I haven't started it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so keep well, following Chloe. Keep <laughs> <laughs> There's that. also um Tap Into Tech, um, founded by Ooh. someone who goes into Warwick. It's incredible, honestly. Um it's not specific to black women in tech, but it's definitely something that you should get involved with. Brilliant. And I would love to mention Code First Girls as well. <laughs> um, our fabulous host. Um, we've got another question. This is from Sally Corker, who said, any tips or ideas for finding jobs in tech, especially if it's your first time in the tech field, making that transition? We've actually had a number of questions from people um, from all different age groups actually asking how to get into the tech industry for the first time. So, yeah, any tips here? Hmm. Um, I mean, I'll jump in quickly. I, I think 
it depends on if you've got because obviously you I'm the odd one out here in the respect of that I don't sort of get involved directly with the tech but I kind of support with you know um, the people that use the tech and, and selling the tech but um, I think if you have any transferable skills uh, that like I said before that you can market towards that that's a really good way to segue into something different completely um, so even if you don't necessarily go straight into like like what these guys are doing for example um, you know you could segue into something different like what I'm doing and that gets you closer to the tech um, and gets you closer to the product and the people that are actually working on it and the developers yeah. and the product team um, and you by nature just get involved with those sorts of conversation and pick, um, conversation sorry and pick those things up and then at some point that would be one way to segue. Yeah, I'd say look on like tech company websites and like go to the career section and look at all the jobs that they have and look at the job descriptions and see like which ones sort of like tickle your fancy. And as I said before, even if there's like a skills gap, there's always a way to, you know, fill in that skill. But if it's if, if it's something that you can do now, um, every tech company has like I don't know, like I can't speak for every tech company, but there's there's so many jobs like there's HR jobs, um, tech jobs. PR jobs, there's like everything. So I think it's such a broad industry. Um, so I'd say, and LinkedIn as well, like setting up job alerts, it will fill your inbox, but it's good to know yeah. exactly like what's out there. Yeah, great. Um, sorry, really quickly. I just want to say that um, even if you're not from a technology background, like even if you didn't do computer science, if you did something like, let's say economics or finance and you want to go into tech, have a look at companies that work in the subject that you study, the subject that you're interested in that have tech jobs. Mm -hmm. So like look at Bloomberg to do data and analytics, or um, if you want to work at, um, if you like fashion and things like that and you want to move to tech, look at Zara or have a look at Charlotte Tilbury if you like beauty, you know what I mean? There's a lot of opportunity, not just in standard tech companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon, but have a look at other industries as well. Oh yeah, that's so true. Thanks, Augustina. Okay, we've got another great question from Hope Votobo, um, which says, how do you personally overcome imposter syndrome? Mm, I'd love to speak on that one. Okay. I think okay. Imposter syndrome is something that you could experience at every level. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you, it's like the fear thing that I said, you know, you can experience fear at every, every level um it's just about pushing through when you feel it and identifying that you feel it and then making your own kind of pathway through it so for example i may feel that i have you know i get imposter syndrome now you know i've been in the game for a long time i know a lot of people and i should be able to just send that email and be like hi jane can you connect me to this person you know i saw they follow you on social media Still handshaking. Oh my gosh! Do you think she's gonna send me the email? But it's like I just push myself through to send the email because the worst thing that's gonna happen is she's just not gonna reply, and I'll just continue living my life. So just know that I feel like you can potentially still feel it at every level, but just do the thing that you're scared of doing. Just always do the thing that you're scared of doing because success is always on the other side, mm -hmm. you know, of that fear. Oh yeah. Like There's that. also like um, practical things, which I have to admit, I haven't tried this, but apparently if you do like a Superman pose, like if you have a presentation before, it can like oh. trick your body. Yeah. Oh. And then little things like emails, I try not to say things like, if that makes sense. I always, always yeah. type it, always type it, but <laughs> I always have to backspace because it does make sense. <laughs> like it does make sense. Um, yes. So I think anything that sort of, shows hesitation in emails just try hard like look over and remove it because mm -hmm. as i said yeah it makes sense yeah definitely you've just got to go in there with that hair flick that's what i do <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i'm ready um we've got time for one final question which is from lucy walters um is there anyone in particular who's inspired you to do what you're doing today so an inspiring figure or someone around you growing up um I think I'll take this one. My like inspiring figure is actually my brother. So my brother um, finished his education at college. He didn't go to university and he started an IT recruitment. And he taught himself how to code. He taught himself how to do everything. And now he is an engineer manager at one of the biggest um, beauty companies in the world. And whenever like I was at university, 
he would always like call me and be like, are you, like, are you on it? Are you working hard? Like, I know you want to work in tech or whatever. And he was actually the person on the day that I moved into my university accommodation. Just before he left, he was like, you should have a look at ARM. I feel like that is something that would be really good for you. And now four years later, I'm a grad. So it's, he really inspired me to realize that I can actually do anything I want to do in this world. And no grades or no body is ever going to stop me because I'm that good. And I think that also ties to imposter yeah. syndrome. You have to believe that you're that good and just yeah. keep on going. So yeah, that's my figure. Oh. I love that. That's so inspirational. And um, we've probably got time for one more answer and then we're going to have to call it a day, I think. Did, um, did anyone else want to answer that one? I think Kanye West. Kanye West inspires me because your life doesn't always have to make sense at every, <laughs> at every stage. I, it, it's okay to figure it out as you go along and it's okay um, for people around you to not understand what you're doing. It's okay for people around you to not agree with what you're saying. It's okay for you to not agree with what you're saying at some points as well. Um, but yeah, just to not like to not be afraid to like not have a conventional route. Like I've jumped around everywhere. Like my background just doesn't make sense. But I always go with my gut and I always go with what I'm feeling. And I know him, but it seems like he does the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, love brilliant that. last love answer. It. Um, thank you so much um, to Code First Girls for having us tonight, um, to our fantastic speakers, um, and I hope you all enjoyed the discussion as much as Zara and I did. Um, if you're interested in our journey, please do follow us at Become Underscore The Program, or keep an eye on our website for our latest blogs and events, um, becometheprogram.com. Um, that's all from us for tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.